Okay, welcome back everybody. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, Microsoft is in talks of buying TikTok after President Trump has announced that he's going to ban the company from the US. He gave them 45 days to finish the deal before TikTok is outright banned. This is much bigger news than most people are making it out to be. I'm sure you've heard about it so far. Most people are talking about how this works in with Microsoft, if Microsoft is a good buy, but this is not just some merger and acquisition. There are some significant ramifications that can happen from this type of deal, specifically China being very upset. Microsoft does a lot of business in China, and if China was to retaliate, it could cause a lot more problems for Microsoft. So we're gonna be talking about that deal, plus the way that Facebook is trying to compete with all of that. And while everybody else is buying tech stocks, Warren Buffett has been buying Bank of America pretty much every day for the past month or so. He's purchased around $2 billion worth of this company. Why is he buying this bank? What does he see in it? We're going to look in that today as well. And Disney's third quarter earnings were released. As you would expect, they were not great. Most of their businesses are shut down, but investors focused on the subscriber growth. And now between all their streaming services, they have over 100 million subscribers. So... Disney has felt a lot of pain during this shutdown. Now that they have 100 million subscribers through all their streaming services, plus they're releasing Mulan direct to DVD, this caused a significant bump in the stock. It's up something like 10% just today. So we're gonna be discussing all of this, plus I'll be giving an update on my dividend growth portfolio and responding to, of course, lots of comments and questions on previous episodes. Okay, now before jumping into all of that, I have to mention the Discord. The reason that I bring it up is you can join the Discord today for free. If you join it today, you basically get the entire month for free. And the first time you'll be charged is the beginning of next month. So you can try it out for this month, see if you like it. And if you do, you can stick around at $6 a month. But the first time you'll be charged is the first of next month. So in the Discord, I'm on it active basically every single day. We discuss general discussion, breaking news, politics, different strategies on dividend growth and real estate. We have people that do research on companies and leave it on the, the research section there. We post our daily trades, what companies we're buying and selling and the reasons why. I have more in-depth research on companies that I'm buying. Recently, I purchased a lot of Apple. That's up about 20% since I purchased it. For weeks, I've been saying that I think Disney's undervalued. That's up about 10% just today and different research like that. So I post all my research on this as well as we have other things in the back burners, different projects we're working on. There's hundreds of active members. It's $6 a month. There's a link to join in the description right now if you'd like to try that out. Okay, now let's first jump into the biggest news item. That is that Microsoft might be buying the US operations of TikTok. This is really big news. It's already gotten a lot of attention, but the attention is well-deserved. This is news that is surprising to a lot of people, especially if you're not following day in and day out the market and you're not following this type of news, you might be caught off guard by this. If you've been following the channel, you probably have because I've been saying for a long time now that we might ban TikTok, that that's a reality, that we really could. And then President Trump announced that he's doing just that. So let's back up a little bit and first lay out why the US is banning TikTok in the first place. TikTok has been under a lot of scrutiny for a while now because of its ties to the Chinese government. The company is owned by a company called ByteDance, and ByteDance is a Beijing-based company, meaning that the Chinese government can request access to any of the data from TikTok anytime, and they basically have to comply. You can't say no to the Chinese government like U.S. companies can to the U.S. government. They say no all the time to different government requests. So this is the biggest concern. If we go back to early 2020, this is Josh Howley, a senator, talking about just this. TikTok was the most downloaded app of 2019, more than any other app in the country. More teenagers are on TikTok now than use Facebook. It counts millions and millions and millions of Americans as users, but it is owned by a Chinese company that includes Chinese Communist Party members in leadership, and it is required under Chinese law to share user data with Beijing. And TikTok has admitted that it has sent user data to China. To put it bluntly, this is a major security risks, risk for the American people. And what kind of data is TikTok collecting as it runs on our phones? A heck of a lot more than you would think. Images, of course, that users post. But TikTok also collects information about the messages that you send, about the apps that you use, the other apps on your phone. It collects the sites that you visit. It collects your search history. It collects your keystrokes. It collects your location data. It stores all of this and maybe lots, lots more. And I can tell you, as the father of two small children, 
uh, who already have many of their friends on social media, even though they're quite young, I find this absolutely horrifying, and we know that it's a national security risk. Since our last hearing on this subject, the Pentagon, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, and the TSA have all banned their employees and service members from using TikTok on government devices. TikTok has been under scrutiny from the U.S. government for a long time. Basically, every government entity has outright banned it. Amazon sent out an email to all employees of their company saying that they need to delete TikTok off of their phone. And then a couple hours later, they sent out another email saying, never mind that first email was sent out by mistake. But obviously, that was something that was being discussed internally by Amazon. Otherwise, that email would have never been sent. India, which was TikTok's biggest country of growth, this is where the most downloads were coming from, banned TikTok because of disputes they had with the Chinese government. Then we had a lot of videos like this shared on social media. This is an Apple feature on the iPhone that tells you if another app is pasting from your clipboard. And it says TikTok pasted from Instagram. Every single time that this person's typing on Instagram, TikTok is pasting the clipboard. And this confirms the suspicion that TikTok in fact was looking at other apps and collecting data off of other apps outside of TikTok. And then with these security risks, and I think other political reasons, Trump said that he will ban TikTok through executive action. He said this on a Friday evening. He said that he would ban it as likely as the next day on a Saturday. This was something that he decided to wait on. He said that Microsoft could buy TikTok and that he was going to give them 45 days until TikTok was banned. So Microsoft entered talks to buy TikTok. And you can imagine how this made the Chinese feel. Not happy. Not good that their big breakout success in tech was going to be bought by a U.S. firm because the U.S. government is going to ban it, that is not something that they, uh, that they appreciated. Now, on top of that, President Trump said that the U.S. should get a slice of TikTok, the sale price of it, which I think is, is a President Trump thing to say. Oh, this deal, I made it happen. I should get a cut of the deal. This is the U.S. government banning a Chinese company, saying that they have to sell their operations to another U.S. company, and then saying that the U.S. government should get a cut of it. That's the situation we're in right now. So President Trump wants a cut of the deal because we're making it possible for this deal to happen. That's his reasoning behind it. And you can imagine how this additional news made the Chinese feel extremely angered. In the eyes of Beijing's leadership, Washington's move to strong arm one of its most valuable global tech companies into selling a lucrative overseas unit is further proof that the U.S. views any Chinese tech company with international success as a challenge to its technology primacy, regardless of the product or how it runs its business. This is exactly how the Chinese view this. They're basically saying, the U.S. government is scared of China becoming a global tech power, and so what we're doing is instead of competing fairly against them, we're just banning their companies and, and forcing them to sell to us, which is unfair play in the terms of the Chinese. Now, obviously, every U.S. citizen listening to this is going to say, you ban Facebook, you ban Google, you ban all sorts of U.S. tech companies, so I don't really feel bad banning TikTok, but the way the Chinese view that is they say that they really don't ban those companies, they're just required to comply by Chinese law, and those companies don't. So they, they're not allowed to do business there. But TikTok was operating within US law. So that's the rebuttal that they have to that. Now it goes on here to say that President Trump's remark over the weekend that he was weighing an outright ban of TikTok in the US sparked nationalist sentiment in China, where the Global Times, a communist party tabloid, derided the situation as, quote, the hunting and looting of TikTok by the U.S. government in conjunction with U.S. high-tech companies. This is the way that China views this. They are absolutely furious over this. On Doyen, ByteDance's domestic analog to TikTok, where video commenting on possible U.S. bans circulated widely, one popular comment suggested that Huawei be allowed to buy Apple Incorporated Chinese operations. Those are the type of things that are circulating in Chinese social media that the Chinese government ban Apple and force them to sell to Huawei. This is what I mean by this is a risky deal. I've also read the same type of sentiment to forcing Microsoft to be banned out of China if they accept this deal. And Microsoft does do quite a bit of business in China. There's a significant amount of blowback that can happen with this. If the Chinese retaliate, which I believe they will in some way, we don't really know what they're going to do. Will they ban some US operation that they haven't recently? Will they ban Microsoft from doing this? Will they put more pressure on Apple? What will they do? They, there's a lot of companies that operate in China that they can mess with. And this type of interaction in the US with TikTok, I think will force their hand into doing something. So this is why I say that there's significant risk with this deal. It is far more than a, a simple merger and acquisition. There are two global powerhouses 
which is China and the U.S. government. And because of the competition between them and the disagreements in the way of running government, there are significant risks involved with companies that operate in both countries. Is there politics involved in this? I think so. In a recent interview with Axios, this is what President Trump said regarding the coronavirus. This was sent to us by China, one way or the other, and we're never going to forget it. Believe me, we're never going to forget it. The Chinese government and the U.S. government are not happy with each other. So this deal being between the the middle of this, between China and the U.S., having both politics and the security risks complicates everything. Sasha Nadella basically is trying to do what I think is the most complicated acquisition ever done. From the Wall Street Journal, it says that merger deals are rarely simple, but Microsoft CEO is now attempting to ink over a takeover agreement that satisfies not only both companies and their shareholders, but two governments in bitter competition for technological clout. I don't envy Satya Nadella, but that's the situation that he's in right now. There is possible retaliation from this. China made up about 1.8% of Microsoft's business. They can do business there because Microsoft mostly does just business-to-business applications, not the social media stuff that China likes to censor. So Microsoft has been successful in marketing its products in China. This makes up over $2 billion a year in revenue for Microsoft. It's said that the company doesn't break down specifically its sales in China, but that's what they estimate it at. Now, we've talked a lot about the the many dangers and risks to this deal without even mentioning the actual deal. There's risks involved with buying companies. Microsoft could pay as much as $30 billion for TikTok's U.S. operations. That is an enormous sum of money for something that's not guaranteed. We don't know if TikTok is going to continue to be a success in the U.S. Users can flee these platforms quickly. Look what happened to Vine. Twitter owned Vine. It was successful for a while, and then some of their top creators or whatever, they left the platform and then it created a trend where everybody started to leave the platform and Twitter ended up discontinuing the service. So in summary, Microsoft could be paying an enormous sum of money for a fast growing, hot social media platform called TikTok in which there's enormous amounts of politics, there's possible retaliation, there's two governments that really hate each other right now that are involved in this as well. It is one of the most complicated acquisitions I've ever heard of. Now, of course, aside from this, we have Mark Zuckerberg He's sitting in the shadows on the side, waiting to pounce, and he found vulnerability in TikTok. And this is the time where he strikes. They just released Reels. Instagram's Reels is the direct competitor to TikTok. This is something that Mark Zuckerberg has been working on for a while. And as a good CEO, he found weakness in his competitor, and he used that time period to launch his service to give him the best chance of success. Like TikTok, Reels allows users to create 15-second clips, and it shares them publicly with friends on Instagram. So this is Facebook, obviously, making their big attempt, and I think this is the time to do it. If there's any vulnerability with this, this is the time. There's lots of people right now leaving TikTok just over basic concerns of all of this. Lots of them are trying to build up their following elsewhere. It's basically, if I saw something drastic happening to YouTube... I would still want my following, so I'd say, hey, everybody, follow me on Instagram. I'm going to be posting there. I'd try to divert my audience somewhere else where I think there's a future. So if people think that TikTok is going to die down, the biggest creators are going to start building up their audience on different platforms. This is what I see going on with TikTok. And Facebook is now trying to say, hey, we're the new home for people that want a platform that's going to be around for a long time. Instagram is stable, doesn't have anything to do with the Chinese government. We don't even do business over there. So come make your home at Reels. This is where you want to be. So all in all, what does this mean? Where does this leave us? Is Microsoft a good investment? Should we buy it? There's a lot of people talking about that. Uh, The real fact is it's very complicated and there's not a clear answer. That's the honest truth. We don't even know if this deal is going to go through. And if it does go through, there's great risk to it. One thing about Microsoft, though, is they are worth $1.6 trillion. They're one of the most well-diversified, stable companies in the world. If they bought TikTok for $30 billion and then TikTok died within a year, Microsoft probably wouldn't even be harmed too much by it. All that would be is significant opportunity cost. They could have used that $30 billion to buy something else that was successful. But either way, it's not going to irreparably damage Microsoft. So do I think you should buy Microsoft? Yes. But not because of this TikTok deal. I think you should buy Microsoft because it's one of the most diverse companies with a fast-growing income. It has Sasha Nadella, who has proven himself to be one of the best CEOs, has continually shown good judgment in directing Microsoft in the right direction to go. Since he took over this company... They've had some flops like every company did, but overall, Microsoft has done incredibly well. 
he continues to push this company in a really good direction. I think Microsoft still has multiple sources of growth, multiple avenues of growth. They're competing really well with Salesforce. That's a company that they're going in. They're making the same type of software. They're taking over big companies like Coca-Cola and others. So Microsoft has done really well. Whether this TikTok deal pans out or not, it may be a new growth path. It's something different for Microsoft, but I think this company is an easy buy either way. Okay, now moving on from that, let's do a quick portfolio update. This is my passive income portfolio. It's geared around creating a stream of dividend income, like this $186 that I got. That's all from dividends, not from deposits. So I get these dividends frequently, basically every single day. I'm getting dividends coming into this account. I use this money similar to how Warren Buffett has done it with his career. He buys companies, he gets massive amounts of cash flow from those companies, and then he uses that cash flow to buy new companies. This is the same basic idea, obviously on a much tinier scale. So I'm not trying to equate this to what Warren Buffett has done with his career, but this is basically the same premise, using cash flow of high cash flow companies to buy new companies to generate more cash flow. That's the basic idea from this. Now with this money, I've gone through and tried to find undervalued companies. This market is pretty difficult to find undervalued companies. Everybody wants to buy tech. That's what's popular right now. When I looked at different tech companies that were also dividend growth companies, I came across Apple. This is one that has been in my portfolio since the beginning, but I had a very small stake in it. I noticed that Apple is trading at a much smaller PE ratio than most of its competitors. Most of its competitors were trading at 35 plus while Apple was sitting around 26, 27. And I didn't think that that was fair to Apple considering the, the brand loyalty and everything around this company. So I put a significant amount of money in this company and so far it's been well rewarded. The company's up over 20% from my average purchase price. So I'm up about $4,000 in this company in about two months. Another bet that I had was Disney. This is one that I had a much higher cost basis because I bought a lot of shares at like 130 or 140 before the pandemic and it's came down in price but I believe that this company has been undervalued for quite a while. Now it's starting to finally trade back up and we're back in the green on this company. Now, while everybody's buying tech companies, that's the big focus, this just seems to go up every single day, it means that these companies are getting more and more expensive. That's what this means, is that every time tech goes up and the NASDAQ goes up more and more, that's great if you're buying it every day and seeing the green, but that can quickly be taken away. That's the warning that I wanna give that can quickly be reversed. The same thing happened with real estate. I was buying real estate all of 2019 and I was in the green by a significant amount. Instead of being down $2,500, I was up like $4,000. I was in the green a lot. I thought, this is great. I have a huge uh, cushion here because I'm in the green by this big amount. And then all of a sudden we have the coronavirus. All the green is quickly wiped away and turned to red. So the warning I would give is when you're buying tech, Still try to focus on the fundamentals. Make sure if you're buying a company that you're not doing it just based purely off of momentum because momentum will eventually stop and then it will revert. So look at the fundamentals of the companies you're buying and base them off of valuations. Are these companies a decent valuation, especially compared to the rest of the market? I thought that Apple, that was a case, but it's few and far between. There's not too many tech companies that I believe right now are really undervalued. So if you're buying those companies right now, I would just do it with caution. Now, if we look into a different sector, while everybody else is buying tech, there's one person buying finance, and that's Warren Buffett. He's been buying Bank of America stock like every single day for the past month. He's bought over $1.7 billion of it. I'm seeing these articles like this one was the first one that I saw. Warren Buffett hikes Bank of America stake by more than $800 million. This is July 23rd. And then about a week later, we see that Warren Buffett adds to his Bank of America buying spree, bringing the stake to 11.8%. He owns 11.8% of this bank. He rarely goes over 10%. And then we have news like this. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has been buying lots of Bank of America. It can go up to a nearly 25% stake. So Warren Buffett got permission to buy a quarter of Bank of America. He's probably still buying it today because it really hasn't moved all that much. Now, the question is why? Why is Warren Buffett buying so much of this bank? Everybody else is focused on tech stocks. This is the coronavirus world that we live in, but Warren Buffett is buying a big US bank, one of the largest ones in the world. What does he see in it? Well, here's an interview from May of this year. This is after the coronavirus had become apparent. Warren Buffett knows about it. And this is his feelings on US banks. I think overall the banking system is not gonna be the problem. But I'm not a, I am wouldn't say that with 100% certainty because there are certain possibilities 
that exist in this world, where banks could have problems. They're going to have problems with energy loans. Mm -hmm. They're going to have problems. Some, you know, they're going to have extra problems with consumer credit. They're going to, have, you know, they're in, but they know it, and they're well reserved. Well, they're 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 well capitalized for it. They were reserve building in the first quarter, and they may need to build more reserves, but uh, they are not a primary worry of mine at all. We own a lot of banks, or we own a lot of bank stocks. He owned a lot of bank stock then. And since then, he's purchased even more. Warren Buffett believes that Bank of America is undervalued. That's the reason that he's buying it. Before this pandemic, it was trading around $34 a share, give or take. And right now it's trading at $25 a share. So this bank has not even come close to recovering. Right now it has a 2.84% dividend. And as long as the US does eventually recover, as long as things aren't worst case scenario, where life really never changes back to normal, the coronavirus just hangs around for year after year after year, if that happens, then yes, the banks will have a lot of trouble and it'll probably destroy book value. But if that doesn't happen and the economy does eventually recover, these banks will be trading at a higher price because they won't have to destroy book value. Both Bank of America and JP Morgan have created huge reserves of cash, tens of billions of dollars to handle potential loan losses. If they don't see those loan losses happen to the extent that they've prepared for, they're going to give that money to shareholders through buybacks and dividends. So these are two companies that I put focus on in my portfolio. I'm trying to build up Bank of America to be as big of a holding as JP Morgan and have them both sitting at around $6,000. So I'm going to put a bet on all of those. I'm not putting all my life savings into them, but these are ones that I think could offer a good amount of potential value over the next year. And overall, if you want to keep up to date with this portfolio, there's a link in the description that you can click that will open up my portfolio, show you every single holding and the percentage I have in each of them. And of course, you can follow the Discord. I have a chat there where I put every single trade I do and the reasons behind doing them. Now, next, we have Disney shares popping after it reveals 100 million streaming subscribers. That's not just for Disney Plus. That's all together. They're ESPN, Disney Plus, all their services. They now have over 100 million paying subscribers, and they're launching a new streaming service. This is pretty big news. Disney stock went up quite a bit after this. It's up like 10% in one day. And I think the reason why is because Disney has been one of the forgotten stocks. Everybody's focused on tech companies. They're focused on Netflix. They're focused on all these big tech companies. But Disney here is a content creation company. Similar to Netflix, they have a lot of original content, they have a streaming platform, they have the ability to come out with content that people are going to want to watch. Everybody says that they're getting bored with the Disney Plus service right now, they've seen most of the Disney library. When Mandalorian Season 2 comes out, and it creates all the buzz, everybody's going to want to see that. So, I think Disney is going to be a force to be reckoned with. When they get their content production back in creation, this is a company I think will continue to do really well. Like I mentioned, they now have over 100 million subscribers. Here's a graph I'll put on the screen that shows the breakdown of it. Disney Plus, they have 57.5 million. That's within like nine months of launching it. Hulu, they have 35.5 million. And ESPN Plus, they have 8.5 million. I think ESPN Plus has had a difficult time because what's happened with sports. But Disney Plus is the growth path for Disney. This is what Bob Chapek and Disney is focusing on the most. The other parts of their company have kind of become like a sideline right now. All their parks were down like 85% in revenue. Their studio entertainment was down 55%. But their growth path is streaming. That is the future. That's what Bob Chapek has said openly that they're going to be focusing on, is building a powerhouse of a streaming service. In fact, the chart there that CNBC provided is a little bit off because it says they have 57.5 million. The latest numbers we have is that Disney Plus reached 60.5 million paid subscribers. Chapek said that this is hitting their goal of 60 to 90 million subscriptions by 2024, four years early. That was their goal overall, to hit 60 to 90 million by 2024, and here we are in 2020 hitting that. So less than one year and they have 60.5 million subscribers on Disney+. Plus. And I think they'll continue to push out content to draw people in. When the streaming service starts to get boring, then they come out with Hamilton. Then they'll come out with Mandalorian Season 2. Then they'll come out with some Obi-Wan Kenobi series. They'll keep doing this to keep people on the service and continue to grow its subscribership. Now adding to this news is Mulan. Disney is launching this for $30 to buy the movie Mulan. And the most amazing part of this is that they, they set it at $30, which is kind of a steep price there. 
it's it's expensive. It's less than going out to the movies. So if you're watching it with your entire family, you can say, well, at least I'm saving like 20, 30 bucks. But $30 just for a movie download is pretty expensive. That shows the confidence that Disney has in their content. They can set a price point of $30 for a digital download and people will buy it. This will make them hundreds of millions of dollars. So they're setting this price point. I think it will do really well. On top of this, and even more incredibly, the only way that you can watch this movie is by also being a Disney Plus subscriber. So they have a gateway that you have to have their subscription service in order to have permission to buy their movie. This is the power of Disney. They can force you to have their subscription to Disney Plus where you pay $6 a month in order to have the opportunity to spend another $30 buying their movie and people will do it. That's the power of Disney. People will do it. Imagine if Netflix came out with a movie that they charged $30 for, and you had to be a paying subscriber in order to get permission to buy that movie. People would be outraged. They'd never have any part of it, but here we are seeing Disney doing this and everybody's going, yeah, that's right. That sounds about right. Yeah, uh, you have to be a Disney Plus subscriber to gain access to have permission to buy Mulan. That sounds good. This is what Disney's able to do. This is what I've said repeatedly about Disney for the past few months. This company is not getting the valuation it deserves. I posted on Twitter about 10 days ago that Disney's an undervalued stock. Since then, it's up like 11%. And this has been the story with Disney. It gets ignored because I think it's not a hot trending tech company. That's the reason why. Even though they have the same technology as Netflix and they have better content, it largely gets ignored. Their growth of their streaming service is immense. Its biggest downside is that it's going through a lot of pain, but the pain Disney is facing is going to be temporary. Whenever I talk to somebody about Tesla and I talk about the valuation of Tesla, what they tell me is they say, Joseph, you're looking at the next year, the next two years or whatever. Look at the next 10 years. Look at the next 15 years. Look at where Tesla is going to be 10 or 15 years from now. But why whenever we talk about Disney, do they say their parks are shut down today? They don't look five to 10 years out. They don't say the parks are going to reopen eventually. Everybody looks at Disney in the short term, but they look at these technology companies in the long term. If you change your perspective on Disney and you look at it in the same frame of mind in the long term, what are going to be the big streaming players five to 10 years from now? Do you think Disney is not going to be one of them? I don't believe it. I think Disney will be at 150 million subscribers, 200 million subscribers, that'll be a powerhouse in the streaming world. I think that Disney will see immense growth there. So even though, since I've been saying this, the stock has gone from really undervalued to now it's it's traded up quite a bit, I still think over the next 10 to 15 years, Disney's going to be at a good valuation right now. Okay, let's get into some emails and questions. Joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com is the email address. The first one is from Mike. He says, hey, Joe, love your show. Joe Biden's tax plan was released. With changes to the dividend tax rate of over $1 million in income, what are the effects of this long term? I understand that neither you or I have a $1 million in income, but that's the dream and the goal. If the goals are achieved through this, dividends would be there, but they'd fall off as soon as you cross over a million. Also, any other thoughts on his tax plan? Thank you so much for making finance and personal income growth fun. I appreciate the email, Mike. This is the goal to have fun, create wealth, uh, which I think are both fun. You know, it's fun to, to talk about things, news and current events. It's also fun to make money. So I think when you can do them both at the same time, that's the, the best situation. Now, I looked at this tax plan, just the dividend part. Basically, what Vice President Biden is saying is that if anybody makes multiple millions in income from dividends, they shouldn't pay that 15 percent uh, capital gains tax, right? They should be taxed at a higher percent. Well, if they're taxed at the normal income of 37%, what would happen is every rich person would not want to pay those taxes. And so they would say, we don't want you to issue money to us through dividends. We just want you to keep it. And then we'll, we'll take the money through selling stock or some other means. Basically, I think it would eliminate dividends as a viable strategy. And even if you made under a million dollars in dividend income, it wouldn't matter because there's so many wealthy people that do make over a million that would not be happy with it, that companies would change the way that they distribute cash to shareholders. So it just would no longer become a viable strategy. Basically, we'd have to change investing strategies. That wouldn't be the end of the world. Dividend investing is great. It's not the only strategy that exists. So we just have to change it for a different strategy where uh, investors get rewarded in a different way. But that would be the outcome of it. Now, just in a general note, when you're looking at tax plans of candidates, realize that 
things change a lot. A lot of contenders put different plans on on their website. They have to win the election. It has to go through Congress. Things get changed left and right. Rarely does it come out the exact same way that it's written right now. So I would not be looking at Joe Biden's tax plan and just believing if he gets elected, it's instantly going to be implemented that way. I think that there's a lot of steps to go through, and usually it's not worth the time to try to figure it out until it actually gets into Congress and you can actually see what they're trying to do. Okay, here's an email where the subject line is, how big can Apple get? Shreya says, hey, Joseph, I'm from India, and I just can't even comprehend that Apple has a market cap of $1.88 trillion, when the market cap of the largest 500 companies in India is only $1.84 trillion. It just seems insane that just one company's value is equal to the value of essentially the whole of India. I guess it's not that unusual when you look at the whole of India was once ruled by just one company, East India Company. But seeing into Apple's valuation, it doesn't seem to be so overvalued. And I would love to see it as a first $2 trillion company. Well, Shreyas, $1.88 trillion is an enormous amount of money. When you compare it to other countries like India that aren't as developed as the US, it can seem kind of funny to compare one company like that to an entire country and say it's about the same value. But that's when you're looking at a global scale. Apple's the biggest company in the world now. Uh, the valuation is based off the fact that they... They made $55 billion in net income in 2019. Not in revenue, in net income. That's what they took home, $55 billion. Look in India and try to find a company that revenues $55 billion, let alone has a net income, a profit of that much. Just look for companies that even take in that much cash, that move that much money. It's difficult to find a company that revenues over $50 billion, but one that nets over $50 billion is extremely rare. Now, Add in the factor that Apple's a company that even during a recession and a pandemic, uh, a huge amounts of job loss, they reported fantastic earnings and they have multiple growth paths. So that's the reason that you're looking at Apple and you're seeing it near $2 trillion is because it makes an enormous amount of money. It has multiple growth paths. It has strong brand loyalty and it's an extremely profitable company. This isn't like the dot-com bubble where these companies don't make any money. Apple makes a fortune. So the valuation of it now continues to expand. The multiples of it continue to expand. When I originally purchased it, it was at about a 26, 27 PE ratio. Now it's like 33 or 34. So it continues to have a higher multiple, which means that buying into Apple now, and as it continues to go up in price, it gets more and more risky. You have less of a cushion there. So just keep that in mind. I remain optimistic, but the higher price you pay with the company, the more risky the buys are with it. Paul says, hi, Joseph. I love your show and just want to get your perspective on something that I've given quite a lot of thought to. I've noticed that you have your investments in your portfolio and the fossil fuel industry. From a strictly financial perspective, moral issues aside for the moment, I see fossil fuel companies as a poor investment. The majority of experts predict that as a global society, peak oil will be reached anytime between 2010 and 2030. Additionally, our society is already moving steadily towards renewable energy sources. The way I see it, the most profitable and productive days in fossil fuel industry are either behind us or are in the very near future. Even if the fossil fuel accounts for a significant portion of the energy sector in the near future, their role will most certainly be decreased from here on out. How do you see this differently? Thank you for your time, Paul. Well, Paul, I basically agree with everything in your email. Thanks for the feedback. It actually made me think about my oil companies that I've owned since the beginning of this portfolio. I haven't added to them much because I decided after initially buying into them that I really didn't want to own these oil companies. I own Chevron and Exxon, and yeah, they power a lot of the U.S. right now, but like you said, they're companies of the past. They're really not moving quickly to position themselves to renewable energy. So even though they'll stay around for decades to come, they'll continually be phased out by new energy sources. I definitely think the future is renewable energy. We see it powering cars with Tesla. We see it powering homes with solar panels. So we can power basically anything with renewable energy. These companies are just there to stick around for a while, but I don't think investors really like them all that much. Now, I've had them in my portfolio for a while, basically just waiting around in case the demand for oil comes up. But you're right, and I actually may take your input, sell out of these two holdings, take the loss of the $500 loss here and put this into a different company. I think that there's other companies that I, I think are undervalued right now, like Bank of America, that I think might have a better future. So uh, I appreciate the email. It makes me focus on some holdings in my portfolio I haven't looked at in a while, and I might make some changes to this. So I'll keep you updated with what I decide to do. 
Okay, well, I'm going to end this one there. I appreciate everybody for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And like I mentioned before, the Discord is free until the beginning of next month. So this entire month, you can join it, try it out, see what you think. And then starting next month, it'll be $6 a month. So see if it's worth it. I think it's a lot of fun. A lot of people in the Discord have been saying that it's well worth it. And they said that I need to talk about it more on the channel so other people know about it. So with that, I will talk with you guys next time.